my lovely, lovely imps, it's time. We're doing another bonus segment. Today is a very busy politics uh, day, as it turns out. Um, I was given um, a, uh, a link to something very, very interesting, which is uh, the Heritage Foundation, the notorious uh, hyper-conservative think tank uh, that pushes some of the most heinous legislation in the United States, released Tucker Carlson's recent speech. Now, if you're watching this live, we just talked about uh, uh, Tucker Carlson being fired from Fox News, or I should say let go, not formally fired. It's kind of one of those uh, mutual things, but it obviously wasn't mutual. They literally just said, you're done. And he said, oh, okay then. Anyway, uh, some people have theorized that this speech actually made Rupert Murdoch angry enough to let Tucker Carlson go. Now, I haven't, th I haven't seen this speech yet. It literally just dropped a few hours ago. So we're going to watch it and we're going to find out uh, if it's plausible that that's the case. Because right now, nobody knows why Tucker Carlson was fired. Um, now, something that, for context, for those who uh, are watching on YouTube, if you're watching on YouTube, make sure you press the like button. Thank you very much. Um, but uh, for those who are watching YouTube, Tucker Carlson is the uh, one of the most popular uh, news shows in the uh, news shows news commentary shows in the entire world uh, He's the number one prime time spot by a large margin uh, The next largest show is less than half of the size of his active viewership and that's from statistics pulled from this year um, His average for this year has been 3.25 million live viewers average for his time slot, which is incredible um, and horrifying. So it seems very strange and very mysterious indeed that he would get let go so suddenly. Um, so we're gonna watch this speech and we're going to see if it is plausible that this speech is what actually got him in trouble. Um, let's find out, let's jump into it together. Again, this is, again, this is Tucker Carlson at the Heritage Foundation. So let's find out what he has to say. I feel a little underdressed looking out in this crowd of handsome, well-dressed people. I just came from work, and if you wear a tuxedo in the air, they think it's the March of Dimes, so I didn't want to make any, you know, I don't think it was a telethon, uh, so pardon my appearance. It's amazing to be in a room. This is far more people than live in the town that I live in. Um, I haven't been in an elevator in three years. That's how remote my life has become, so it's just very cool, or worn socks for that matter. Uh, Be in a room full of nice people, um, and I want to thank you, Father Scalia, wherever you are. That, I, that invocation, for some reason, that, uh, that really got me. Um, yeah, it did. And it, actually, I'll just tell you, since it's just us and no one's watching, um, that it, it reminded me that I don't pray enough for the country, and I should. And I'm, I'm upset. Uh, but the answer is, is to include the country in your prayer. So thank you for reminding us of that. Um, anyway, thank you. I just want to start by saying that I'm grateful to be here and I want to tell you why I am here. There are two specific reasons. Um, the first and most immediate is that during this fall's midterm elections, I got almost every single call wrong. I typically don't weigh in on races because, you know, what do I know? I don't actually cover politics. I'm not that interested. Um, but this time I got so spun up and so emotional okay, that I convinced myself there was this wave coming this political liberation that was going to happen, and I told her, Oh no. Oh no, is he cucking himself out immediately? Oh God, that's so sad. Viewers that in some great detail, and introduced a series of candidates who subsequently lost as, you know, the new governor of New York or fill in the blank, and it was so humiliating uh, to be that wrong in public, often wrong, not usually in front of other people, um, that I thought, I've just got to take some time off and think about why I was so unbelievably wrong. So I went pheasant hunting, not that it was the pheasant's fault, but that is kind of a way to clear your head. <laughs> and, I, um, and I wound up, because bird hunting really is, again, not good for the birds, but very good for you. And I wound up 
uh, in South Dakota with Kevin, among other people, including a couple of my college roommates. And I was just, I was so impressed by him as a person. And really, the, having spent my life in Washington, I can tell you, if you're not from here, the, the key question about anybody who runs any institution in Washington is how false is this person? <laughs> God sends messages, we can't immediately translate all of them. Uh, so I, I can't tell you what that meant. There clearly is meaning. The point is, uh, the man who runs Heritage is not false at all. In fact, my assessment of him was, he's completely real. He's, a complete, he's an honest person. He means it, he's not playing a role. And that was so thrilling to me to see that. And by the way, it was confirmed by one of Heritage's security people who was standing backstage with me, and I asked him, because the security guys always know they're all former cops. You know, they've seen everything. They have seen humanity. That's a, that's a funny one. Whew. Ah, uh, yes. The, the uh, police officer... The police officer file fired for gross misconduct for killing random innocent people to security guard at a conservative convention pipeline. My God. My God. The in various states of drunken undress, like you can't shock them. And they know who's real and who's not. And I asked, you know, what do you, what do you think? And one of them said to me, to my face, I would go to war for him. And I thought, and, and these are the kind of people who will tell you the truth. I mean, like, why would he lie to me? I don't even know his name, but he meant it. Um, what an and asshole. so to see a leader, a real leader at the helm of an institution that matters, that has the kind of throw weight that Heritage does, was thrilling, yeah. was absolutely thrilling for me. Nice try, Infernatrix. You're not getting me to play Tucker Carlson reading the Vaporeon copy pasta. Not happening. Not today. Not today because the story of the last decade is the collapse of leadership, not of the population. The people remain noble and decent, so far as I can tell. I still live here, I'm never leaving. We have good people, we have terrible people in charge. And not just of our government, but of the institutions that I grew up in, the Episcopal Church, my high school. You know, I could just go on and on and on. They're all run by weak people. And, you know, it's the same in marriage. You know, weak husband causes angry wife. Weak leaders cause an angry country. That's true. Oh my, oh my God. Just say the, the, okay. By the way, what he's referencing here is the, uh, the very popular, I'm not kidding you, actual fascist saying, uh, uh, you know, strong men make good times, good men make, or yeah, good, uh, good times make weak men, Weak men make bad times, bad times make strong men. That's the, uh, that's the thing that he's referencing here. That was what he was saying when he said, you know, bad, you know, weak husband makes angry wife, angry wife makes bad country. Oh my God. Okay, well, this is, to be fair though, so far, this is pretty bog standard for Tucker Carlson. Do you guys see, do you guys see why I said that so far I'm just not convinced that this sp this speech is what would have got him fired? I mean, maybe he goes crazy and starts like throwing poop or something halfway through this speech, but I just don't know. Personally, I think we don't know. We haven't gotten the info. There's something else that happened, but let's take a look. And to see someone who's not a weak leader at the helm of heritage just thrilled me. Um, so I wanted to come for that reason, just being totally blunt with you. And the second reason is to pay homage and to give some measure of thanks to Ed Fulner for giving me my first job, which changed my life. And I was, to say I was not a promising hire would be an understatement, that's not false modesty. In, in fact, if anything, I'm underplaying it. Um, but I was leaving college without a degree or a job and attempting to marry my girlfriend, which I subsequently did, and ran into this giant roadblock in the form of her Episcopal priest father who said, no, you know, job first. Um, and not only did I not have a job, I had like no idea what I wanted to do. And so well, now you have no job again. So I applied to a couple of different places, the CIA, if you can even imagine, um, <laughs> some boarding school in Rabat, because I thought, you know, Morocco, lower standards, maybe they'll hire me, no. And I, w I wound up. Um, at Heritage, as you heard, uh, as a fact checker, copy editor, 
um, at Policy Review, the quarterly magazine. Guys, remember that this is the Heritage Foundation. Uh, the Heritage Foundation is not even the type of conservative that would be like, I don't like the FBI because they were mean to Donald Trump. The Heritage Foundation is the ghoul, is like the ghoul party, okay? The Heritage Foundation is made up of the richest and most evil people you can possibly imagine on the country, in the country. It is the, it is the foundation that is completely and utterly compromised by old money heirs. That is what the Heritage, I mean, it's literally in their fucking name. The Heritage Foundation is all about uh, preserving power for America's oldest and most richest and most conservative families. It is like, I'm not, not, not even slightly, uh, 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 you know, I honestly, if anything, I'm understating just how uh, ghoulish this particular organization is. This is not like uh, a Trump rally where people are drinking beers and waving giant foam fingers. Did you see the people who are here? They're wearing diamond brooches and stuff. Also, not a single non-white face in the entire audience. This is the, the, the audience that he is. This is the, these are the people who bankroll the conservative movement, okay? Just keep that in mind of the Heritage Foundation, and it, that job absolutely changed my life. I was paid $14,000 a year plus a $100 bill for Christmas. Have you not seen this speech before? This speech is, was posted today. This is a new speech. Unless they're reposting this, they only just posted this recording today. This was from a couple of days ago. Anyway, let's continue which Dr. Fulner gave out personally to the entire staff, at least half of whom went downstairs and bought liquor with it at the liquor store, <laughs> which I think is now part of the intern housing. Um, but it was a long time ago. It was so long ago I smoked in my office. That's how long ago it was. That's like, that's like riding a mule to work, just to put it in the context of American history. Smoke in your office? Yeah, I did. Um, in fact, Matt Spaulding told me to stop one day and I thought, wow. Uh, this modernization program is moving too fast for me. I, I can't deal with it. I've always been conservative in the truest sense, but Matt, you were right and I quit. And uh, anyway, um, but yes, it was a long, a long, long time ago. And in the course of that job, though I didn't get rich to be honest with you, um, I did learn what I wanted to do with the rest of my life, which was become a journalist. And that was really under the Remember how I said that he uses the excuse of being an entertainer, but he constantly refers to himself as a journalist or a news show? There you have it. There you have it. Guidance of a man called Adam Meyerson who ran it, who was, on, uh, that was 32 years ago. And to this day, he really is the kindest person I've ever worked for. Just kind and patient and exact. He thought I was completely nuts. He thought I was a lunatic. And, um, and I could tell he thought that, uh, but he was patient with me through my entire year and a half there, helped me get my next job at a newspaper in Arkansas um, because no one else would hire me, but he set me up with this job. He walked into my cubicle and said, do you wanna move to Arkansas? And so I called my bride, who was a religion teacher at the local Episcopal school, and I said, do you wanna move to Arkansas? And said, what a wonderful woman she's turned out to be. And she said, of course, is that near Colorado? Quote, quote. <laughs> <laughs> very, but she was willing to go there. Um, very much a Northeasterner at heart, but, uh, and we did and we loved it, but I got there because Adam Meyerson felt that it was his job to help me get my next job because his job was to train up reasonable people and put them in journalism, even if it meant sending them to Arkansas. Um, and, and I was thinking about Heritage this morning in the shower, not a place I think about it, but I did today. And what makes it great, and one of the best things about Heritage, over time, longitudinally, 50 years say, is that Heritage has always hired a lot of people. And that is an underrated thing. It really is. <laughs> Giving people a job, even if it's 14 grand a year plus a $100 bill for liquor. God, this is the most, this is pathetic. I mean, one thing that you can't, that you can't say about Tucker Carlson, the man is totally willing to lick a few dicks. God, is he willing to suck a few boots, huh?
This man is just, he really is Rupert Murdoch's bitch through and through. This guy just, oh, you, oh, oh, he's just groveling. Literally opened his speech by being like, I, oh, I was so dumb and I was over enthusiastic. Please don't kill me. I'm so sorry. I'm here to, I'm, I'm not here to give a speech today. I'm here to polish your boots. You, you change someone's life. You put them on a, on a trajectory. At least that's true for me. I mean, I had not succeeded in school, to put it mildly. And I did not feel, I always, I always felt like I was smart. Not one other person felt that way. Dude. Until I got to Heritage. Dude. I'm not sure they were super impressed, but they treated me like an adult. Because they had high, they had high intellectual standards. They were standards of honesty. And, you know, the idea at Heritage when I worked there wasn't just that, you know, we're fighting this war against that's the other amazing, side, of LB. course. But it did not logically follow from that at Heritage that you could say whatever you wanted. Just because the other side was rotten didn't mean you could be rotten. They really hewed to the highest standards of factual accuracy, to intellectual honesty. They really meant it. They did. And even if you didn't agree with them, they were very serious about it. They were intellectually serious people, every single person I worked with. The receptionist in the office at Policy Review was going to school at night to learn Russian. Okay. And then the week I started at Policy Review, the Soviet Union collapsed, which was an amazing thing. The coup against Gorbachev in the third week of August, 1991, was the week I started at Heritage. And in retrospect, of course, you never appreciate the significance of things as they happen to you. You can't really know what the movie's about until it ends. But at the time, we didn't really appreciate how, well, two things, one, our entire political orientation was based on this war between the United States and the Soviet Union, this Cold War, but very much a war. And every part of our politics, as you well remember, those of you my age and older remember, every part of our politics revolved around that central conflict. We were in conflict with a country that was both anti-markets and anti-Christian. And that put in stark relief our own beliefs what? And what would happen when I that forgot, ended? I forgot. I forgot that they were that they they convinced themselves that the Soviet Union is like an, actually anti. Oh God. Oh my. Oh my God. Yes, he believes. He believes that they. Yeah. Oh boy. When there wasn't that clear contrast, that's the first thing. This is right here, by the way. This is him bemoaning the days when it was easier to have a more obvious enemy. This is him crying about, oh, it was so easy to just hate the Russians. It was so easy. Oh, God. And of course, the second thing is we could never have known the third week of No, T. Smith, if you have a link to that, I would love to see that because I imagine that probably, that would probably contribute to this. If you have a link. August 1991, as we saw totalitarianism die, that it would ever come here. We just couldn't imagine that. You know, we believe that victories were permanent. They're not, of course. That's the first lesson of history. You know, nothing is permanent except our own demise. And doesn't God. he love Russia now? Yeah, it's interesting how much he sucks the cock of Russia now, huh? But, but we didn't kind of get that. You know, if you told me then that this week the Department of Justice would have indicted a group of people, people I don't agree with, by the way, on a lot of different issues, black nationalist socialists from Florida, okay, kind of not my demographic, but would have indicted them for criticizing the U.S. position, the Biden administration. True, Luxander, this week, he's, uh, I mean, him being a squeaky little weirdo has always been his thing, but he seems particularly squeaky right now. This makes me, I don't know, I don't want to read too much into it, but again, so far, we're about halfway into his speech, and so far, nothing that would at all justify people theorizing that this is what caused him to lose his job. His position on the war in Ukraine and charge them with felonies for which they're each facing 10 years in prison. If you told me that could happen here, I would have laughed at you. No, we have a first amendment. Like, that can't happen here, but it, it has that and a lot of other things which are gravely unsettling actually. And people who, who were rooted in the, the cold war story and the reality of the cold war, again, my age, 53, kind of know where that goes. So the purpose of my talk, which I, by the way, I will keep brief. I'm an inveterate talker. I can literally talk forever. <laughs> you can't even imagine my capacity for loquaciousness. I mean, it just, it has Is no- Is he talking about Black Hammer? He might actually be. He might actually be talking about Black Hammer. 
It's a bottomless well. You know, if you dropped a quarter off the observation deck of the Empire State Building, how long would it take to hit the sidewalk? That was always what we talked about when we were kids. You would never hear it in my case. I can literally go on first. So I will stop and Kevin and I are gonna have a conversation which I think would be much more edifying. But I would just say two things about the present moment because I, I think about them all the time. And I brood on this constantly. And then I take every afternoon because fundamentally I'm Swedish, I take a sauna every day. As a, as a rest, I do, I'm not kidding, every single day, never miss it. And my whole family does, as a re, it's like our one cult, cultural contribution. Oh, we're Swedish, ooh, it's a very deep ethnicity. <laughs>
he has been all he's ever done is sell out his values of course not to mention the interview in which he said that i am literally richard murdoch's uh, or uh, uh murdoch's bitch things you know they don't believe because they want to keep their jobs if there's a single person in this room who hasn't seen that through george floyd and covid rupert and murdoch, the ukraine sorry, war richard. raise Why your is hand richard rupert murdoch oh nobody right you all know what i'm talking about and you're so disappointed in people. You know, you are, and you realize that the herd instinct is maybe the strongest instinct. I mean, it may be stronger than the hunger and sex instincts, actually. The instinct, which again is inherent to be like everybody else and not to be cast out of the group, not to be shunned, that's a very strong impulse in all of us from birth. And it- Self-report. Again, self-report. This guy is talking about how Oh, oh, I'm just a, you know, we're just all conformists. Everybody is equally as submissive and conformist as me. Takes over, unfortunately, in moments like this, and it's harnessed, in fact, by bad people in moments like this to produce uniformity. And you see people going along with this and you lose respect for them. And that certainly happened what to me. What is he at talking about? He's, he's doing an Abe Simpson-esque rant right now. He's trying to appeal to the insanely old population of people in front of him by basically assuring them that they're job creators, telling them that their grouchy rants that they give to their grandchildren are totally fine, and that yes, everyone is equally as uh, calcified and unthinking and cowed as the rest of you ghouls. He's basically just jerking off their egos in real time. That's all we've seen so far. It's scale over the past three years. I'm not mad at people, I'm just sad. I'm disappointed. How could you go along with this? You know it's not true, but you're saying it anyway? Really, you're putting your pronouns in your email? You're ridiculous. You know, but no one else thinks it's ridiculous. Oh no, it's your pronouns in the email. What does that even mean? What does that even mean? You're saying things you can't define. LBGTQIA plus? Who's the plus? See what I mean? He's just reassuring this stupid, old, calcified audience that yeah, actually, everyone, it's, it, they're all just lying. It, nobody actually knows what LGBTQIA plus means, even though nobody even uses that anyway, which is the hilarious part. But, uh, but yeah, apparently, apparently nobody, it's, it's not, it's not you. You're not the problem. It's everybody else. Everybody else is just as stupid as you. They're just pretending. The plus is invited to my show anytime. Find a plus and I'll interview him. What's it like to be a plus? Am I a plus? Uh, I'm serious. I feel like. Are you? I think I'm an addition. Does that make me a plus? No one even knows what it is. And the whole society, LGBTQIA. All right. What's the plus? Oh, shut up. Racist. Okay. So you, you reach that place and you feel, and this is one of the reasons, Father Scalia, I, I was actually overcome a little bit with am emotion as you prayed because am I, am I, I realized that I was so upset by the behavior of some people I love, frankly, in a country I revere and always have, um, that I wasn't praying for the country. You know, that's on me and we all should be. But back to my point. So you see the sadness happening. But there is, as there always is, this is a fact of nature and theology and of observable reality, there is a countervailing force at work always. There's a counterbalance to the badness. It's called goodness. And you see it in people. So for every 10 people who are putting he and him, him in their electronic JP Morgan email signatures, there's one. Just, uh, just let's take a moment. This guy has been spending the first 14 minutes of this rant talking about the great evil. And his example of the great evil is he, him pronouns. This is the, this is the, this is the conservative movement. They are actually terrified of he, him pronouns. They got nothing. They have nothing. They're deranged. I know that I've been banging this drum a lot lately about the fact that conservatives are just insufferable and that nobody can stand them and that we should be bold in calling that out and going, guys, nobody can fucking stand them. But it's just true. 
these people are so insufferable. They're so annoying. They're so pathetic. All they do is get mad at the most inconsequential things. The M&Ms, the Bud Light, the, the he, him pronouns. They're so, they're so weak and they're so fucking annoying. And we should say it. We should fucking say it. The person is like, no, I'm not doing that. Sorry, I don't want to fight, but like, I'm not doing that. It's a betrayal of what I think is true. It's a betrayal of my conscience, of my faith. I would be betraying God. God would be offended if I said he, him pronouns. Oh. Faith? Of my sense of myself, of my dignity? I will not betray my God. My God forbids the purchasing of Mixter, of Mixter Potato Head and the M and M and M's. My God prevents me from drinking the woke beer, the beer of wokeness. As a human being of my autonomy, I am not a slave. I am a free citizen and I'm not doing that. I'm not a slave. I'm not a slave. I think for myself, I think for myself, I say as I admit on a giant platform that I just sadly cry in my sauna every day of my life, that I can't escape my crushing, uh, overwhelming sense of existential dread. Do you remember how I constantly say that conservatives are the most unhappy people on the planet? This guy is the heir to a fortune. This guy is one of the most popular conservative figures on the planet. And all he can do is cry in his sauna. And he's willing to admit that in front of the Heritage Foundation. Broken people. Sad, broken people. And there's nothing you can do to me to make me do it. And I hope it won't come to that. But if it does come to that, here I am. Here I am. It's Paul on trial. Here I am. And you see that in people, and it's a completely unexpected assortment of people. I'm really interested in cause and effect, and as I noted at the outset of my remarks and my ability to predict the future, <laughs> working on that. But because I'm sort of paid to predict things, I try and think a lot about you know, what connects certain outcomes that I should have seen before they occurred. And in this case, there is no thread that I can find that connects all of the people who've popped up in my life to be that lone brave person in the crowd who says, no, thank you. Uh -huh. You could not have known who these people are. They don't fit a common profile. Some are people like me. Some of them don't look like me at all. Uh -huh. Some of them are people I despised on political grounds just a few years ago. I could name their names, but you may not even know about their transformations. And I don't want to wreck your dinner by telling you who they are. But there is, in one case, someone who I made fun of on television, and certainly in my private life in vulgar ways, who was really the embodiment of everything I found repulsive, who in the middle of COVID decided, no, I'm not going along with this. And once you say one true thing and stick with it, all kinds of other true things occur to you. The truth is contagious. Lying is, but the truth is as well. And the second you decide to tell the truth about something, you are filled with this, I don't want to get supernatural on you, but you are filled with this power from somewhere else. Try it. Tell the truth about something. You feel it every day. The more you tell the truth, the stronger you become. That's completely real. It's measurable in the way that you feel. And of course, the opposite is also true. The more you lie, the weaker and more terrified you become. We all know that feeling. You lie about something and all of a sudden you're a prisoner of that. You mean like how you lie about everything on your TV show? You mean like how you lie about how much you support Donald Trump while in private talking about how much you hate Donald Trump and you think that he's a demon who will destroy the movement that you supposedly care about? I guess, I guess Tucker Carlson really would know something about being weak. But you want to know who's strong? You want to know who does tell the truth? You want to know somebody who's been willing to take shit? That's right, Demon Mama. So if you're watching this and you're enjoying this, smack like and smack subscribe right now. Don't wait a minute. Because you know you want something better than this garbage. I make this shit livable so we can finally, finally dig through this guy's garbage and try to figure out what the hell he's saying. Can you believe that someone this boring 
runs, uh, sorry, <clears throat> ran, <laughs> his show's canceled now, of course, ran one of the most uh, popular shows in the world, I should be that popular. And you should join me in becoming that popular. Let's continue. That lie, you are diminished by it. You are weak and afraid. Drug and alcohol use is the same way. It makes you weak and afraid. Huh? But you look around and you see these people and some of them really have paid a heavy price. For Damn, you mean like, you mean like the most popular conservative broadcaster of all time, uh, Rush Limbaugh, who used drugs and alcohol and tobacco for his entire life, who abused pain meds for his entire life and never got off of them? Hmm, trauma dumping again and also, uh, not to not to call it hypocrisy, just pointing out the fact these motherfuckers don't actually stand for anything at all whatsoever. For telling the truth. And they are cast out of their groups, whatever those groups are, but they do it anyway. And I look on at those people with the deepest possible admiration. I am paid to do that. I face no penalty. Someone came up to me, you're so brave. Really? I'm a talk show host. <laughs> it's like I can have any opinion I want. That's my job. That's what the fuck? What the fuck? I need to do that. I face no penalty. Someone came up to me, you're so brave. Really? I'm a talk show host. <laughs> it's like I can have any opinion I want. That's my job. That's why they pay me. Is that I'm sorry. He's, it feels like he... This whole speech, it felt like, like he's, maybe he, maybe he does know. Maybe he knew he was going to get fired in advance. He said that he only learned 10 minutes in advance, but maybe he knew it was coming. This is, this really is like some trauma dumping, desperate jokerfication nonsense. I, like, Tucker is always very dramatic and very weird, but this is something else. This is some, like, public breakdown shit. I'm brave to tell the truth on a cable news show, and if you're not doing that, you're really an idiot. You're really craven. You're lying on television. Why would you do that? Why would you do that, Tucker, while you were saying in private that you hated Donald Trump and you couldn't wait for him to no longer be president? Why would you lie on national television, my friend? Why would you do that? You're literally making a living to say what you think, and you can't even do that? Please. But how about if you're a senior vice president at Citibank? I'm serious. At Citibank. And you're making, you know, four million a year. And you've got three kids in Bedford and two are in boarding school and one starting at Wesleyan next year. And, like, you need this job, honestly. And your whole sector is kind of collapsing, and you know that. There is no incentive whatsoever for you to tell the truth about anything. You just go into the little re-education meetings and you're like, yeah, diversity is our strength. That's exactly right. We need equity in the capital markets. Okay, all right. So if you're the one guy who refuses to say that, you are a hero, in my opinion. And I know some of them. In fact, my job is to interview them. And I sit back and I look at these people and I give them more credit than I do people who display physical courage, which is often impulsive, by the way. And I'm not denigrating physical courage, which I deeply admire, but you interview people who do amazing things, you know, who rush into the proverbial burning building. And like every man is kind of trained from birth to fantasize about what he would do when the building catches fire and you hear a baby crying and so you run inside. No one is trained to stand up in the middle of a DEI meeting at Citibank and say, this is nonsense. He's actually doing the braver than the troops meme. He's trying to say in this speech that, pe that people who say, no, I won't put pronouns in my bio. I will dare to be racist in the workplace are braver than the troops. Maybe this is why he got fired. <laughs> Holy shit. What the fuck? That is, that is like, I don't know. On one hand, conservatives love that shit. All of these ghouls who are all air heirs and heiresses absolutely love to be told that they're braver than the troops. But also, this is so pathetic. 
do you understand why this doesn't resonate? Like his message resonates only with the Trump cult. I've talked a lot this stream about how popular his show was, but you have to remember that his show is popular among conservatives. No one who's not a conservative watches his show. Like he is, he's the number one guy among conservatives, but conservatives are still a minority because the average person hears this type of shit and goes, bro, what the fuck are you talking about? You're trying to tell me that you think a guy who refuses to, to re respect someone's pronouns is braver than someone who runs into a burning building? What the hell, man? This is so embarrassing. It's so pathetic. And the people who do that, oh, they have my deepest admiration. And so their example really gives me hope. It thrills me. I talk to them all day long, people like that. That's the first thing. If you, if you send, uh, uh, if you send an email to your office that contains a Ben Garrison cartoon, you are braver than the troops. If you send an email saying, uh, excuse me, I identify as attack helicopter to your, uh, group, your group chat at work, you are braver than a firefighter. We should, in this sad moment of profound and widespread destruction of the institutions that people who share our views built, by the way, earlier generations that would agree substan substantially with every person in this room, they built those and now they're being destroyed. And oh, that's so depressing. But we can also see rising in the distance new things, new institutions led by new people who are every bit as brave as the people who came before us. Amen. Here's the second thing I'd like to say before I get to the conversation with Dr. Roberts which is that it, it might be time to start to reassess the terms we use to, <laughs> to describe what we're watching. So when I started at Heritage, the presumption was, and this is a very Anglo-American assumption, that the debates we're having are kind of rational debates about the way to get to mutually agreed upon outcomes, right? So like we all want the country to be more prosperous and free and people to be less oppressed or whatever. And, so we're gonna argue about tax rates and I think higher tax gets, gets us there. I'm like Keynesian and you disagree, you're an Austrian or whatever. But the objective is the same. And so we write our papers and they write their papers and may the best papers win. I, I, I don't think that's what we're- Thick boy, thick boy. Thank you very, very much for the incredibly generous $15. If you want to support this show, this is a 100% viewer supported show like Thick Boy has just so generously done. Please consider throwing some donations into my donation button on my website or super chatting through YouTube. This show, once again, is 100% viewer supported. So if you want to be as based as Thick Boy, consider throwing some tips my way right now. Thank you very, very much. Let's continue. Watching now at all? I don't think we're watching a debate over how to get to the best outcome. I think that's completely wrong. Uh, Posadas John says Austrian. He's talking about the like Austrian school of economics. He's making an economics joke. It's stupid. And I've come to this conclusion, not, and I should say at the outset, I'm an Episcopalian, so don't take any theological advice from me because I don't have any. I grew up in the foul, shallowest faith tradition that's ever been invented. It's not even a Christian religion at this point. Um, I say with shame, but I'm just saying this as an observer of what's going on. There is no way to assess, say, the transgenderist movement with that mindset. Policy papers don't account for it at all. If you have people who are saying, I have an idea, let's castrate the next generation. It's all they talk about. It's all these people talk about. He's all he's talked about this entire thing, besides rambling about like ye days of old, the only things he's gotten mad at is pronouns, diversity in the workplace about pronouns, and now the transgenderist movement. Oh my God. Generation, let's sexually mutilate children. I'm sorry, that's not a political debate, what? It has nothing to do with politics. What's the outcome we're desiring here? An androgynous population? Is that really what we are? We arguing for that? I don't, I, I don't think anyone could like, defend that as a positive outcome. But the weight of the government and uh, you know, a lot of corporate interests are behind that. Well, what is that? Well, it's irrational. 
If you say, well, you know, I think abortion is always bad. Well, I think sometimes it's necessary. That's a debate I'm familiar with. But if you're telling me that abortion is a positive good, what are you saying? Well, you're arguing for child sacrifice, obviously. It's not about. Oh. Okay, so he's pulling Alex Jones stuff. Okay. Like, oh, a teen, you know, a teen girl gets pregnant and what do we do? Well, apparently they like it. Do about that and victims of rape. I, you know, I get it. I, of course I understand that. And I have compassion for everyone involved. But when the treasury secretary stands up and says, you know what you can do to help the economy get an abortion? Well, you're, that's like an Aztec principle, actually. There's not a society in history that didn't practice human sacrifice. Not one, I checked. Even the Scandinavians, I'm ashamed to say. It wasn't just the Mesoamericans, it was everybody. So like, that's what that is. Well, what's the point of child sacrifice? Well, there's no policy goal entwined with that. No, that's a theological phenomenon. And that's kind of the point I'm making. None of this makes sense in conventional political terms. No, none of, you should have just stopped at none of this makes sense, my man. This is just in, insane drivel. When people or crowds of people, or the largest crowd of people at all, which is the federal government, the largest human organization in human history, decide that the goal is to destroy things, destruction for its own sake, hey, let's tear it down. What you're watching is not a political movement, it's evil. So if you want to assess, and I'll put it in non, and I'll stop with this, I'll put it in non, I'll put it in non-political, uh, or non, rather non-specific theological terms, and just say, if you want to know what's evil and what's good, what are the characteristics of those? And by the way, you know- Oh, that, that beeping, by the way, came from their recording. That's not from me. That was on his end. Okay, so this part is actually deranged, but I still don't think that this would get, this is nothing other, this is exactly what he puts on his show all the time. He talks about this type of stuff on his show all the time. It's typical tr uh, Tucker derangement stuff. It's typical conservative insanity, but none of this is like anything that would be firing worthy. Yeah, fash audio, exactly. I, I'm I'm interested I'm interested to see if he goes further off the rails. We have we have a little bit more before he does like a Q and A session. We have like ten minutes left of this speech, but so far I don't buy the theory that this is what got him fired. This is his normal crap. I, I think the Athenians would have agreed with this. This is not necessarily just a Christian notion. This is kind of a I would say widely agreed upon understanding of good and evil. What are its products? What are these? two conditions produce. Well, I mean, good is characterized by order, calmness, tranquility, peace, whatever you want to call it, lack of conflict, cleanliness. Cleanliness is next to godliness. It's true, it is. And evil is characterized by their opposites. <laughs> Violence, hate, disorder, division. This is like dollar store Jordan Peterson crap. Uh, uh, I don't know. Like, every time I listen to Tucker Carlson, it just reminds me how pathetically boring and terrible the conservative movement in America is. How dreadfully uh, insufferable they are. But again, none of this seems firing worthy to me. Disorganization and filth. So if you are all in on the things that produce the latter basket of outcomes, what you're really advocating for is evil. That's just true. I'm not calling for religious war, far from it. I'm merely calling for an acknowledgement of what we're watching. Which is not what, and I'm not, certainly not backing the Republican Party. I mean, ugh. I'm not making a partisan point at all. I don't get, I, I don't actually get the joke. Is the joke saying that he actually is arguing for religious war? Is that what, is that what the joke was supposed to be? 
I'm, I'm just noting what's super obvious. Like those of us who are in our mid 50s are caught in the past in the way that we think about this. One side's like, no, no, you know, I've got this idea and we've got this idea and let's have a debate about our ideas. They don't want a debate. Those ideas won't produce outcomes that any rational person would want under any circumstances. Those are manifestations of some larger force acting upon us. It's just so obvious. It's completely obvious. And I- S Satan, he's, he's, he's doing a demon rats here. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Posadas John, for saying it literally the same time I did. This is just the demon rats. He's saying that the Democrats are demonic and that Satan is puppeting the Democrats. But again, that's Christianity for you. Like half of the Christians in America actually believe that. I think two things. One, we should say we, that. Guys, we live in America, the land of spiritual warfare. For you out there, you blissful non-Americans, uh, for the last 100 years or so in America, there has been, but specifically, uh, it, it became most uh, popular around the, the 70s into the 80s. Uh, this uh, there is an idea that is incredibly popular in the Christian movements in America. Uh, uh, this idea of spiritual warfare, and um, if you're wondering how I know this, it's because I grew up in a Christian fundamentalist cult, which I escaped uh, just before my 20s. Uh, I have a whole video on it, um, but. Uh, the, this is very popular in Christian movements across America, the idea of spiritual warfare. What spiritual warfare means is that they literally believe that there are angels and devils that directly interact with politics um, in America, that you have a responsibility to participate in politics with the knowledge that you are either, that you are joining into spiritual warfare with literal devils. It's where the whole demon, it's like the, it's the core idea where the demon rats, where the like satanic cult obsession comes from, is this idea of spiritual warfare, which was very, very popularized across the US. And most people outside of the US will hear this and go, oh, like only like, like monks believe that type of stuff. No, it's very common among Christians in the US. Yeah. Anyway, just figured I'd provide some context. And stop engaging in these totally fraudulent debates where we are using the terms that we used in 1991 when I started at Heritage as if maybe, you know, I could just win the debate if I marshaled more facts. I've tried that, doesn't work. And two, maybe we should all take just like 10 minutes a day to say a prayer about it. I'm serious, like why not? And I'm saying that to you, not as some kind of evangelist, I'm literally saying that to you as an Episcopalian. Retcon 404 says, remember when a fly landed on Obama and the conservative Christians? Yes, of course I do. When there was, there was this, some people might not remember this, some of you might be too young, but there was a time when Obama was speaking at, at an event and like a fly like landed on his head. Um, and uh, the conservatives, it was literally like talked about all over the place by conservative Christians. They said that that was a sign that Obama was a demon and that he smelled like sulfur. And that's why there were flies flying around him because he was the prince of lies. He was a demon that had like a fly aura around him and the flies were landing on him because he smelled like hell. I'm not kidding you. Like, I'm not kidding. Oh God, it's so, it, I always feel like it's so hard to tell people that there are so many American Christians that actually believe this shit. They actually think that. This is, oh God, it's just so, it's so ridiculous. Ugh. The Samaritans of our time. I'm coming to you from the most humble and lowly theological position you can. I'm literally an Episcopalian, okay? We got it, bro, we and got it. And even I have concluded it might be worth taking just 10 minutes out of your busy schedule to say a prayer for the future. And I hope you will.
Good job. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so that's it. That's the speech, everybody. I I do not think that spit that speech was what was what got him fired. I'm sorry. I that was cringe. It was insane. It was uh, uh, embarrassing. It was uh, s sad at parts uh, where Tucker Carlson is talking about how depressed he is and how unhappy he is and how he can never escape the sadness even when he's sitting in his sauna. He just sits there and broods on his sadness. Uh, it was definitely very, very uh, uh, full of hate. You know, he, he talked about trans people like 15 times. Um, it was uh, disconnected from the average American. Uh, but I don't think that's what got him fired, guys. Uh, uh, Vanity Fair wrote an article or published an article uh, saying that they thought that his religiosity might have been what got him fired here. But I just don't think so. I think that is uh, outrageous. So, um, yeah. Well. It seems less unhinged than his usual segments. In some ways, yes, and in other ways, no. Um, the weird, uh, the, 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 the spiritual warfare stuff is a little bit out of the ordinary for him. He usually doesn't go that religious on his shows. Uh, he usually tries to keep it a little bit more secular, but not that much. Like, it's not that drastic. So, I have no idea. Um, what can I say to this except what I always say about conservatives, which is that the conservative movement in America is a calcified rock weighing us all down. Uh, they are uh, they are convinced uh, that their hatred is 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 a virtue. They have convinced themselves that they are warriors fighting demons because they send um, angry emails to their supervisor saying, no, I won't respect pronouns in bio. No. Uh, they think they're braver than the troops because they won't put their pronouns in their bio, a thing that no one has ever been forced to do anywhere ever for any reason. Uh, they're confused by letters and numbers. Um, they don't believe in basic science. I mean, he did anti-vax rhetoric during this, still. The conservatives are still pushing anti-vax rhetoric, despite the fact that hundreds of thousands of, wait, what's the, what's the count? Hold on, let's see. Uh, one second. Over, over, well over a million people in the United States have died. Well over a million people have died from COVID-19. Oh, we read that. Uh, yeah, see, this was the one, this is what I was referring to, Merrick. Here, real quick, just, just so we know, just so we have it right here. This is what we read earlier in the stream and it will actually be present in my other Tucker Carlson uh, segment, but Rupert Murdoch was perhaps unnerved by Carlson's mess mess messianism, 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 uh, messianism, because it echoed the end times worldview of Rupert Murdoch's ex fiance Anne Leslie Smith, uh, a, an internal source said. In my May cover story, I reported that Murdoch and Smith called off their two week engagement because Smith had told people that Tucker Carlson was a messenger from God. Murdoch had seen Carlson and Smith discuss religion firsthand. In late March, Carlson had dinner at Murdoch's Bel Air Vineyard with Murdoch and Smith, according to the source. During dinner, Smith pulled out a Bible and started reading passages from the source or from the book of Exodus, the source said. Rupert just sat there and stared. A few days after the dinner, Murdoch and Smith called off the wedding. By taking Carlson off the air, Murdoch may have also been taking away his ex's favorite show. We read that earlier. I just it's juicy, but I don't think I buy it. I just, I don't think it's true. Nothing here is that far out of the ordinary. He he didn't go, he didn't go full, uh, he didn't go full Alex Jones, where Alex Jones would be like, I pray to God, I, I pray to God, God, please, please help us against these demons and goblins. God, God, I'm calling out to you now, warriors of Christ. I need you. I need you right now to save us from these demons. The demons are coming for me right now. Buy my brain force or the demons are going to get me. God, help me. God, help. He didn't do anything like that. So, um, you know. 
I don't know. Maybe though. Not 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 trying to 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 completely dunk. Click the Twitter link. Oh yeah, that's the one I'm talking about. I mean, it is possible. It is possible that uh that like Rupert Murdoch is just having like a crazy old man moment. Uh but I don't know, but Rupert Murdoch is he's not I mean, he is, he still has a ton of power at Fox, but what is his actual position right now? Didn't he pass formal leadership over to his son? Yeah, Lachlan Murdoch is the one who's in charge right now. I don't think he's in charge of the network anymore. You don't understand. Australian conservatives are repelled by religious fundamentalists, unlike Americans. Maybe. Okay, so maybe the real thing that happened is that Tucker hooked up with Murdoch's partner. <laughs> maybe. 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 Maybe his son hates it even more? Hmm. I don't know. I, I think... I, I think we're yet to find out, uh, you know, exactly what's going on. I don't know. I don't know. What's his current, what is he currently? He's still, wait, he, wait. Rupert Murdoch is still the chairman of Fox Corporation. He's just not the chairman of Fox News. He's the chairman of the, of the, uh, uh of the, the parent company. So, Huh. So maybe. And he still could have a say. I don't think that's entirely out of, uh, you know, out of, out of the possibility. He could just be having an angry old man moment. He is 92 after all. This shit does happen. Like, I don't want to completely rule it out because, because at the end of the day, we've seen conservatives get old and go fucking crazy uh, a million times. It doesn't seem like there's a hard answer right now. Maybe we'll find out in a couple of days. Maybe we'll find out soon. Anyway, if you enjoyed my fun, comedic, critical, and context-adding reaction to this deranged Tucker Carlson speech, make sure that you subscribe and leave a comment below. And don't forget to like the video. It means the world to me if you help this channel grow because you know First of all, look at it. Look at how look at how beautiful. Look at how beautiful this stream looks. It's amazing. Listen how beautiful it sounds. And also, I'm going to bet that you actually laughed. And you wouldn't have fucking laughed if you were just watching Tucker Carlson by yourself. You wouldn't have felt good if you were just sitting through that crap by yourself. So support the channel. Like, subscribe, and leave a comment. And thank you for being an imp.